And so we have a, a distinguished panel to uh, help us explore these issues. Again, towards the end, we'll have a time for questions as well. But first of all, um, we have a, a session with um, uh, someone who's probably the, histori the, uh, the kind of nation's favorite historian right now. Um, maybe Dominic Sandbrook might uh, <laughs> have something to say about that. Um, but I'm delighted to have with us um, uh, Tom Holland, uh, who many of you will have read his book, Dominion, and um, we'll be exploring a little bit one or two of the themes on that. So please, would you give a warm welcome to Tom Holland? I've got to say, if Dominic knew that a bishop was praising me as the nation's favourite historian, it would confirm all his darkest suspicions. Well, there you go. <laughs> please, nobody tell him. Okay. Well, you can tell him if you want to. It's all yours. I will be quiet. There you go. <laughs> nobody else tell him. Good. So, Tom, we've got a, a half an hour just to have a conversation around um, the church's role in shaping our national life. And I guess I wanted to begin with a, a more general question about history. Um, we, we all know the, the famous quote by, um, by Henry Ford, uh, history is bunk. In fact, the, the, the full quote apparently goes like this, history is more or less bunk. It is tradition. We want to live in the present and the only history that is worth a tinker's cuss is the history that we make today. So there you've got one kind of um, position, which is kind of saying actually history doesn't really have a great impact upon the day. What matters really is what we do right now, innovation and so on. At uh, the other end of the scale, we've got maybe people who would say, well, actually, we're, we're kind of bound to kind of repeat the mistakes of the past. Uh, and I've often noticed listening to the rest of history, you often draw out the ways in which some of the themes you, uh, and the, the periods you talk about are kind of reflected in the present. But out of that sort of spectrum, um, just the way into our thing, how, how, how do you sort of feel about um, the way in which history shapes our current life? Are you at one end of the spectrum saying, well, actually, history is past, it's kind of interesting, but doesn't really affect the present, or are you at the other end of that spectrum to say, well, actually, no, there is a kind of a, almost inevitable repeating of, of past patterns. Well, there's, there's a, a kind of very opposite uh, statement to, to Ford's opinion, which was expressed by um, Fox, as in Fox's Book of Martins, mm -hmm. who was quoting Cicero, um, the great Roman orator in the first century BC, um, and, and quote Cicero as saying that um, those who do not know the past are like children. Um, and Fox, of course, is writing with a very intense awareness that history matters and crucially, because as a, a, a Christian and more specifically as a, as a Protestant who is um, in self-conscious opposition to um, an explanation of the past that he is now in opposition to, so the, the, you know, the explanation of the past given by the Roman church, he... He wants to believe that history is an expression of God's purpose and of the role played in it by God's church. And so Fox is very committed to the idea that the Reformation is not some, the expression of something new and radical, as his Catholic opponents would say. And so he, of course, advances the... the the proposition that the, the Reformation is about a return to the, the, the primal standards of the church in its glorious early days. But he's also very committed to the idea that, say, um, the, the Church of England is something that was founded by um, people back in the Anglo-Saxon period. And that um, just as uh, people in the 16th century are translating the Bible into English, so the Anglo-Saxons had done the same. And that therefore, this is a model of history that does not emphasize the role played by the papacy, you know, Gregory the Great and sending Augustine or whatever, but is, um, it's, it's, it's about native traditions in England that are also the expression of the English church's communion with God's purposes. And in that sense, I think, you could argue that to live in a Christian country is to live in a country with a very profound sense of history. Um, and so the argument over how old the Church of England is, I think a tweet was put out mm. earlier this year mm. saying that the Church of England goes back to whenever. Mm. And there was lots of discussion about whether this was correct or not. But I mean, it is a really, really kind of live issue. And it reflects the broader issue that the, the, the Christian notion of there being a beginning and an end 
which is something we tend to take for granted because we're absolutely steeped in it, is a very culturally contingent one. Um, and in that sense, I think that um, it's really telling that the first great work of, of um, history by an English writer, by Bede, is a history of, mm. of the church in England. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Ford, uh, you know, he is the expression of, um, of a, a kind of mentality that sees history as being bunk because it is something to be rejected um, because we live in a new vibrant industrial age and that is um, a, an understanding of the industrial age that's powerfully informed by, by Darwinist thinking. Um, but I think that um, America remains as, as shaped by uh, a, a Christian and indeed a, a, a Protestant sense of history as, as England and Britain is. Yeah, thank you. So there is a sense in which we can't entirely escape um, history. And as we're looking back into that story, I want to spend a bit of time thinking about a particular period of that history, which has been important in shaping our kind of national life. And there's a chapter in, in your book, Dominion, um, I think it's the one called Spirit, uh, where you, um, uh, you write about Gerard with William Stanley, yeah. this uh, amazing figure who is a, um, a cloth merchant, a smallholder, who starts digging on land that he shouldn't be digging on in St George's Hill, which is now I mean, some fancy golf club or something like that. Oh, so so he, I mean, he's a proto-communist. Yeah. There's there's a there's a um, a, a monument in um, St Petersburg that was put up when it was Leningrad, and it lists um, uh, proto-communists who mm. want to be celebrated. Mm. And Gerard Wynne Stanley is on it. He's the only English yeah, okay. person on yeah, okay. this. So he's in the kind of hierarchy mm. of communist saints. Yeah. Um, and it, there are two brilliant ironies about St. George's Hill, where he and his, his fellow band of diggers occupied. It was kind of public land, and he, 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 you know, he says that, um, that, that all, all of earth is God's gift, and therefore it is the common property of all. Um, and this is in the wake of the execution of the king in 1649, and a few, you know, a few weeks, months afterwards. Um, and so it's, it, it, it's always taken as the expression of that kind of radical explosion of Protestant enthusiasm that follows the execution of the king and the kind of imminent establishment of the Commonwealth. And you, you can go on a, a digger's tour around St. George's Hill, but you can't actually go onto St. George's Hill because it's a gated community. And you can only go there if you're very, very rich. And what makes it even more delicious is the fact that um, one of the people who had a house on that in the 60s was John Lennon, who imagined no property, yeah, no heaven, yeah. no religion. Now, you, you, you pick that story as part of your account of the kind of Christian um, formation of our culture. What was it particularly about that story that, that you wanted to draw out that, that told, told you something about our kind of Christian um, heritage as, as a nation and the role of, of the, the, the faith is played in that? Well, I think, I think, um, I, th I think that religion lies at the heart of the, the conflicts that, that kind of grouped in, it used to be called the English Civil War, now the War of the Three Kingdoms. Um, and when I was studying it at school, it was very much framed as, as kind of economic, it was a kind of Marxist understanding of it, rise of the gentry, all that kind of thing. Um, I, it seems to me clearly now that, that understanding of religion lies at the heart of it. Um, and the, 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 the Puritan tradition, which is, is so important in America as well as in, uh, in England, obviously provides a kind of animating fire for the parliamentary victory, I think. Um, but as always happens in revolutions, um, those who begin it tend to discover that the revolution is running out of their control. Uh, and in that sense, Win Stanley is the perfect embodiment of it because um, Thomas Fairfax, who was the commander of the, um, the victorious parliamentary armies, and is already feeling that the revolution is getting slightly out of control. Uh, he famously, his, his wife at the trial of Charles I had, had um, kind of cried out from the balcony that, that what was happening was, was wrong and that Thomas Fairfax wouldn't be a part of it. Um, 
he, he goes he goes to see what's going on and he's kind of he's kind of mildly interested in it and he lets them go on but it's clearly kind of an expression of the division between the, 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 the commanding heights of the revolution and people down on the ground and I think when Stanley is the embodiment of, of this idea that um, and the reason that he appears in a chapter called the Spirit that when you read scripture what matters is what the spirit is telling you the fire that is in your heart um, you know the, be on the right side of history, all that kind of thing. And I think that Winston Lee is a is a, a, a kind of foreshadowing of trends that are still very, very manifest in in British society at the moment. Um, his concern for the, a sense of, of, of the entire planet as a, as a gift to all of humanity. I mean, you can see that that's very evident in protests that are ongoing um, around the environment. Um, and uh, a kind of hostility towards property, towards elites, uh, to, to, to channeling into kind of um, economic understanding of what a society should be, of, the, of kind of notions that, you know, the last should be first, what does that mean? Um, and, and when Stanley's heirs, which is why, you know, his name appears in, on a, a communist monument in Leningrad, um, will result in um, all kinds of trends that may not seem to be overtly Christian, but I think have, have kind of Christian assumptions kind of in their marrow. Yeah, you mentioned there the, the execution of the king, and uh, obviously the, the Civil War is that period in our, in our history, that great convulsion at the time when um, you had rounders and cavaliers and different sort of sides of that. And I guess one of my questions is, does that still have an ongoing relevance for today in I terms of the, the relationship, particularly to, to, to the monarchy, those who are particularly you know, pro and against mm -hmm. and so on? Are, are, you know, are there still those kind of trends in British society today? Yeah, I, th I mean, I, th I, I, I guess that, um, that um, I remember there was a very good a thriller by a guy called Anthony Price, who I think lived in Oxford actually, um, and it was set against um, the backdrop of a kind of sealed knot battle. Mm -hmm. Remember the sealed knot kind of restaged civil war battles, and um, uh, so a, a roundhead gets killed in this battle. He turns out to be a kind of a, a, a radical Trotskyist, and, and the Secret Service are all. Cavaliers, and there's definitely a sense that, and this was, I think, it was written in the 70s, that yeah. the, you know, the the, the proto-Thatcherites are on the side of the Cavaliers, and the, the kind of the, the, the radical Trotskyites and Marxists yeah. are all carrying pikes in the New Model Army, mm. and I, I, it sticks in my, my mind. I must have read it when I was about 12 or 13, but it sticks in my mind because it does. It, it is an expression of something that I would then go on to find when I read Christopher Hill. Mm. Uh, you know, great historian of, of um, the world turned upside down, wrote a biography of Cromwell and so on, who was a Marxist and who clearly very strongly identified um, his values and beliefs with, um, with, with the good old cause. Michael Foote would be another example, and, I th and Tony Benn. And to that extent, I mean, I don't think that, that Jeremy Corbyn was as intellectually engaged with the period as, as Tony Benn and and Michael Foote was, but I mean, he's very influenced by them. And so Corbyn's influence on a whole new generation of radicals, mm -hmm. I think suggests that you can trace a, a line of living descent all the way back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the sense of civil wars, whenever they happen, they tend to kind of have an ongoing life, whether in the United yeah, States just, or I, in the UK. Yeah, and, and um, you know, the argument of Dominion is that um, you don't need to be church going um, to be radically shaped by Christian assumptions. And if the Civil War was about Christian, basically different understandings of Christianity and, and, and what God wants from churches, then, um, do you need me to? Yes, sorry. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> then uh, the voice will ring out loud and clear. It will not be silenced. Um, what was I saying? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think that the, the, the traumas and the issues at stake in the Civil War have had such a seismic impact in shaping the way 
that we understand the divisions that have persisted throughout our society right the way up into the 21st century, that we can't really understand the, the, the and, and with this I would completely concur with Cicero, I'm sure Cicero would be thrilled to know, um, that, um, that, that we can't really understand the present without knowing that, that the more you, you, you kind of immerse yourself in the, the, the literature and the polemics and the, the, the thinking of the Civil War period, the more it shed lights on the present. Going on from that, I guess, you said, I mean, some people have said that the, the real revolutionary moment in English history was the glorious revolution of 1688, the deposition of a, of a sort of Catholic king and, and said the, the imposition of a Protestant king. And I suppose even still now, when we were reminded of this in the coronation, that the king made these professions of Protestant faith. Uh, he, he was meant to say, I will to the utmost of my power maintain in the UK, in the United Kingdom, the Protestant reformed religion established by law. Um, that was a bit of a, oh gosh, this is a bit of a surprise when those words were said. And I suppose my, my question is, do, do you think that the Protestant character of the monarchy still has any meaning anymore? How Protestant are we as a, as a nation and as a kind of structure? Well, I, I think um, it, instinctively, psychologically, culturally, we remain very Protestant. And I think that, that that Protestantism recently, because the fact, because the internet speaks American, means that in a way we've, uh, that cultural Protestantism has been Americanized. Mm. And I think you, you get a sense of, of how seismic that influence can be when you look at Ireland, mm. a very, very traditionally Catholic country that I think now essentially, you know, it's, it's kind of elite ideology is a kind of soft, godless form of cultural Protestantism. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to that extent, I think culturally we do remain Protestant. But I think the great genius, or I mean, you may well think it's the great tragedy of, um, of, of Christianity and perhaps particularly Protestant Christianity in the modern period has been its, its genius at kind of marketing its insights and its assumptions as being not culturally contingent, but as somehow being universal. So, very Protestant, oh, have I gone again? Has that gone? No, you can still hear me, good. Very, very Protestant notions of words like religion, secular. Um, these have been spread across the world. You know, they've, they've gone to India, they've gone to Turkey, whatever. And um, they are accepted in, you know, in, in non-Christian countries on the basis that they are not Christian, but I think that they absolutely are. And to that extent, I think we, we do remain uh, very Protestant. And the corollary of that is that if we live in a secular society, and I think that to live in a secular society is to live in a society that is fundamentally shaped by, by Christian and in British context, Protestant assumptions, then the effectiveness of that depends on disguising its Christian character. So if people can say to Jews or Muslims or Hindus, um, you live in a secular society, um, therefore all religions are treated equal, that's a really Protestant way of, 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 of seeing things. And the fact that it is still framed as the, you know, the division between church and state, you don't say synagogue and state, you don't say mosque and state. Um, but I think that that is a problem then for those moments, key moments in national life where the overtly, um, if you want to say, use the word sectarian, Protestant character of the state, I think that's a real problem. Uh, and I think it is a kind of an issue therefore for the Church of England. Because what does the Church of England do? Does it, does it affirm its distinctively Protestant character as you know, Fox would have done? The, the notion that the Church of England is, a, 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 you know, it's true to God's purposes? Um, or does it dissolve itself into the kind of broader secular marsh of, uh, that, that is the, the kind of the current um, uh, orthodoxy of how our society should organize itself? And I, I, I suspect that it's opting for the latter course. Yeah, and we'll look at 
we'll look at some of those themes this afternoon when we look at the theme of transcendence and the relationship between the Church of England and some of the wider kind of other religious communities as well. Um, I want to move, move on to something slightly more modern, which was um, the coronation uh, of uh, last year. And, and I guess many people were surprised at how religious it was. Um, as I said a moment ago, we hadn't seen one for 70 years, and so it was like a bit of a surprise to pretty well everyone, uh, apart from those who were in their 90s, who kind of just about remembered the last one. And um, I guess my, my question is, how did you react to that kind of religious nature of the coronation? Did you feel this feels anachronistic, a bit of a hangover from the past, or did it still express something really quite important about sort of national life, about the, the role of Christian faith and the church in, in, in the nation? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I, and I loved it in the way that I would have loved seeing a triceratops roam across a Dorset <laughs> field. Um, I love old things. I love things that are deeply rooted in the past. And to see a ritual that, you know, the, the current order of service goes back to the reign of King Edgar in the 10th century, but in turn draws on um, foreshadowings that go back to, you know, to the Carolingians and back ultimately to, you know, to the Iron Age, to, to the age of Solomon. Um, I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Um, was it just a dinosaur though? Well, so this is the question. This is the question. I also felt, I mean, I feel that we are kind of living through a new a, a process of, of cultural and, and, and moral change at the moment that is analogous to the Reformation, the, the Protestant Reformation. And it, it, it felt a bit like manifestations of Catholic culture in the reign of Henry VIII. You know, he's broken with Rome, but he, he's still in it, you know, he's still essentially Catholic. Um, but you have the sense of, of, of the the kind of the hot Protestant reformation of his son kind of looming around the corner. And I slightly felt that watching um, Charles give his coronation oaths, because I, I, I mean, what I know of William, he doesn't seem a man who is greatly interested in this kind of thing. Uh, the Queen obviously was a, a very, very committed Anglican. Um, and, you know, all her Christmas messages would always foreground the Christian message. Um, the king, likewise, is, is famous for his interest in, in religion and, indeed, all kinds of spiritualities. Um, I, I don't get the sense that William is. And in that sense, William may be a king more in tune with a country that basically, you know, in, in, in a decade or two decades or whenever he, he, he is crowned, will have slipped the moorings of Christianity even more. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that, I just want to get this out again, because I always say this every time I, I, I speak to um, a, a, a communion of Anglicans. One of the reasons for that is that despite uh, the Church of England running large numbers of schools, they uh, do not seem to be inculcating a familiarity with the Bible in generations. And so generations are growing up at the moment with a complete ignorance of the most basic fundamentals of biblical stories. And it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not, whether you're an Anglican, a Catholic, a Jew, a Muslim, whatever. I really do think that if you're going to have a sense of communion with the history and politics and uh, culture of this country, a basic familiarity with the Bible would be incredibly helpful, but it is what it is. And um, I, 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 I think that the implications for a ritual that is founded um, you know, on the coronation of Solomon, of that, you know, another 10 or 20 years where people have no idea who Solomon is, I think will be, I think it will be, will be more of a challenge. Thank you. And yeah, just one last question before we go to our, um, get some other contributions. Um, uh, it's, I mean, it's sometimes said that um, the, you know, the only two countries in the world that have clerics involved in its government are Iran and Britain. Um, we have bishops in the House of Lords, we spoke about that earlier on, and um, I guess the question is, is there any ongoing justification for that in a modern democracy? One which, as you say, is in the process of slipping its Christian moorings, and, and also, what do you think, uh, would you have any advice for bishops in Parliament? Sometimes perhaps the Church of England lacks a bit of confidence in its public role. What are the kind of things that bishops and others should be doing in that public, public role in its... its um, 
opportunity to speak in the public life? I, I, I feel I'm woefully unqualified to advise bishops. I mean, I guess, I, guess I, I, I think that, again, it devolves to this question that seems to me to be confronting the Church of England in its public pronouncements and its national role all the time, which is, does it affirm its distinctiveness, it, the, the, the sense that it is the embodiment and expression of, of God's purpose, or is it part of a kind of, you know, is it, is it the, the kind of the religious wing of multiculturalism? Um, and I, again, you know, I, I don't know what the solution to that is. It seems both, 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 both options seem to me fairly invidious, because in the one way you are kind of proclaiming a sectarian identity that will not go down well, and on the other hand, you lose everything that makes the church distinctive. So both options seem to me tricky to negotiate. Um, I mean, I think the one, th the one reason, for, for one brilliant reason for keeping bishops in the House of Lords um, is that it's so annoying to humanists. Um, <laughs> and, he, and we're talking about the legacy of the Civil War. Uh, the, the kind of regular, the, the sight of humanists um, deploying the, oh, Britain is just like Iran argument is a glorious testimony to the enduring hold of uh, civil war polemics. Uh, earnest moral hostility to bishops still has a, a place, even in 21st century England. And just one, just to follow up on that last question, I mean, this is, I guess is more general about Christian witness in the current um, climate. I mean, what I guess your arguments about in Dominion is that actually we are we are far more Christian than we realize, even secular, secular Britain. And so in a context where actually can the Christian faith is, as you argue, pretty well everywhere, what has the church to say that is distinct? Exactly, and I think that's the problem. Because, because I think in a way that the church has been too successful. Um, you know, over the course of the 20th century, lots of, of what traditionally, ever since you know, the, 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 the Roman Empire, the church had been providing, whether it was um, help for the poor or education or health or whatever came to be nationalized. And I think that um, now what's happened is that its core teachings likewise have been nationalized and rebranded and repackaged um, as just being the way that people think, uh, you know, just be kind. Um, and, and people don't tend to think where this comes from. And the risk then for the church is if you say, well, actually that's ours, people will say bigot. <laughs> So it's a real problem. <laughs> yeah.